Okay, so it is one o'clock now, um, and we hopefully we'll get a few more people joining in as uh, as it goes through. But I think we'll just kick off now. Um, so, welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Fard, and I'm the chair and organizer of Grand Rounds. Um, part of the program as we're developing it for 2020 and 2021 is to introduce more um, global citizenship, uh, environmental and sustainability talks through in, into the Grand Round program. Uh, and today is one of those slots. So uh, I'm grateful to the sustainability environmental team uh, along with the global citizenship team uh, for organizing these. And um, I am uh, gonna hand over now to Rodney Mountain, one of our ENT consultants, who's gonna share the rest of this session um, uh, and introduce the speaker. So Rod, straight over to you. Thanks very much, Tom, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've been quite passionate about uh, sustainability for a number of years, and it's lovely to see things starting to come together. Um, we've got a lot of passionate clinicians, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience are, are here today because of that passion to really uh, make a big difference. Um, in Tayside, we, uh, some of you might know Philip Wild. Um, he's the head of property, environmental and quality managing that sort of part of um, our environment. And Philip uh, runs a group that is starting to make a difference um, and is uh, aspiring to achieve some of the NHS Scotland uh, goals in, in relation to longer term sustainability. There's some very clear targets um, that are being set by the government and um, Philip and a small group of us are working on this and we would love you as members of the audience to sort of join in on this, this journey. So um, I'll, I'll pause there and, and would like to just describe the theme today under HEAT, H-E-A-T, Healthcare Environmental Sustainability in Tayside. And um, just unpicking a little bit of uh, what, we, what we're trying to do. We're gonna start the afternoon with Kate Dapre, Chair of the Sustainable Scotland Network and the Head of Energy and Sustainability in Scotland, um, presenting on NHS Scotland's aspirations to net zero by 2045, as I understand it. And then Pavan uh, Bangalore, who's in the audience with us, and Grant Rodney, um, two passionate anaesthetists in the, uh, the organisation, are going to give us some examples of what they've done and um, a vision for what we could do in the future. So without further ado, Kate, do you mind if I hand on to you and then we'll hand on to Pavan after that? Yep, great. Thank you, Rod. And I'm just going to share my screen. Um... Okay, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as I was introduced, I'm not quite um, head of energy and sustainability for the whole of Scotland, but for um, uh, NHS, NHS National Services Scotland. And for those of you who are not aware, that's a special board where we provide a lot of advice and support to on a whole range of topics, but to the rest of the NHS. And I lead the energy and sustainability team there. So we work with all of the NHS boards, including Tayside, and we mentioned Philip Wilde earlier. Um, but we lead on the, the sort of national approach to energy and sustainability that we're taking across NHS Scotland. What I want to talk to you about is what we're, we're trying to do, what the aspiration is. Talk about some of the achievements, because I think we've maybe some people aren't quite aware of how far NHS has come in some of these areas. Um, talk a little bit about the challenges that, that, that are coming up and some, but some of the resources that are available. So it's really just to give you a picture about, about where we stand with all of this. Um, the, the first thing to talk about is that, uh, if I can get the slide to move on, there we go, um, is 2019. So pre-pandemic, there was a big push towards declaring a climate emergency. Scottish government did it, a lot of organisations did it, and NHS, we were put under pressure to declare our own climate emergency, and we didn't for two reasons. One was we didn't feel that we needed to declare an emergency as well because we are the NHS. That's not what we do. When somebody declares an emergency, we respond to it. But secondly, and the main reason why we didn't was because we'd actually already declared an emergency around climate change. And um, so some time ago, 
slide says 10 years ago, I'll need to update that, it's actually 11 years ago now, but back in 2009, uh, the World Health Organization, the Lancet, declared then that they saw climate change as being the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So we have been working under the auspices of a climate emergency for well over a decade. So we didn't really feel the need to explain that again. We just reiterated what we've been saying for, for quite a long time. Now, just to put you just in the picture of, of how this sits with uh, in, in the context of NHS Scotland, I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, normally when I, I give this talk, I have to maybe explain to people how NHS Scotland is constituted. I'm sure you're all aware of that. But in terms of our environmental impact, so this is the impact that NHS Scotland has to, um, to sustainability and to climate change. Um, our buildings emit just under 400,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum. That is about one to two percent of Scotland's total, but it, it you know it, it varies, goes up and down a little bit. In addition to that, there's about another 50,000 tonnes of CO2 associated with our waste. We've got um, vehicles on top of that. Again, they, they contribute about another 60,000 tonnes. And then there's our big there's our supply chain, which I'll talk about in a minute. A little bit of the elephant in the room, and I can't give you a figure of how much CO2 that 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 that, that would equate to, but but it's it's a lot. Um, to put it in context with NHS Tayside, NHS Tayside last year emitted round about thirty eight thousand tons of CO2 from your, from the buildings. I haven't included the transport in those figures, but in terms of environmental impact, it's about the fourth highest in Scotland in terms of board, which which you would expect. So the the biggest uh, contributed environmentally is NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde followed by Lothian. Um, so Tayside comes in about, uh, about fourth. Um, globally, this report came out in 2019. Um, it was a report done by Healthcare Without Harm in Europe in conjunction with, with Arabs. And what they said was um, globally, healthcare accounts for about four and a half percent of all global emissions, slightly higher within the UK, but it's but it, it, it's in that kind of four to five percent uh, range. What that report also showed is that if we were to properly quantify the emissions associated with our supply chain, particularly pharmaceuticals, that that actually dwarfs everything coming from our, our buildings and our transport. Um, the little graphic on the right there, just to explain what we mean by scope one, two and three. Scope one emissions are those emissions that we directly burn. So that would be gas, oil um, and the fuel used in our owned fleet. Scope two is purchased energy where the actual generation of the energy is done somewhere else. So that would be electricity and district heating. Scope three is everything else. So that's business travel, waste, water and supply chain come into that. So this report suggested that, that actually supply chain accounted for that, the biggest chunk of those emissions. But perhaps more importantly than our environment, our impact on climate change, it's the impact that climate change is going to have on us as the NHS and on our ability to deliver services. Um, I've put a few stats up there for you, but um, fuel poverty, for example, costs the NHS in Scotland about £80 million per annum to deal with. Now, fuel poverty, the way that that's defined is that is where an, a family is spending more than 10% of their income on fuel uh, or, and fuel for, the, for housing, not, not transport. Um, people in extreme fuel poverty that's classed as if they're spending 20% or more. Now, I'm quite ashamed to say that in 2020, Scotland, one in four families are living in fuel poverty in Scotland. There are some areas of the country where that statistic is an awful lot higher. I find that quite shocking. And the kind of things that that, the kind of problems that gives to us in the NHS are things like respiratory illness, mental health impacts, um, and other health things associated with people living in cold, damp homes. Poor air quality, and this is particular. This is mainly associated with nitrous oxide emissions from buildings and from transport, accounts for about 2,000 premature deaths per annum in Scotland, and costs us about two billion to deal with. Again, it's respiratory illness, and it's and it's those kind of things. One thing that's happened with the pandemic and the reduction in transport is some of our most polluted streets have seen a 40 to 60 percent reduction in the nitrous oxide. So, you know, it's it's been a positive impact. Some of the extreme climate events that we're seeing now carry with them quite drastic physical and mental health impacts. Um, there was a study done by Public Health England a couple of years ago in relation to the flooding that had happened in the north of England. And some of the 
conditions that patients were then presenting with anxiety, stress, particularly amongst young people who had been displaced from their homes. We had young people presenting with phobias of rain. We had, um, you know, all of these mental health impacts associated with it. And that, again, you know, carries a big burden to the NHS. And, you know, the, the, I put some other things in there about around, again, the impact of our supply chain, about the societal cost, about rising health inequalities. And what we've seen is that climate change impacts, like a lot of things, impact those most vulnerable in our society the most. Then we have, you know, as, as we see these more extreme climate, uh, climate events, it's the impact that then ha that has on us our capability of actually delivering a service. So what do we do if our if the if our hospital gets flooded? What do we do if the, the routes to that hospital get flooded? What do we do if we see storm damage in, in some of our, 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 um, uh, our buildings or our transport, all of that kind of thing? So the health impacts associated with climate change, that, that's where now our senior management and our chief executives are starting to pay attention it's now genuinely causing us issues about how we deliver our service going forward. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the achievements across NHS Scotland, because I said I don't think people are all, always aware of this, but um, if we go back to 1990, that's the baseline year of the Climate Change Act in Scotland. Um, NHS as a whole across our built environment has reduced our energy consumption by more than 43% since then, and our carbon emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions are down by more than 62% over that same period. They are, I have to tell you, world leading figures. They are way ahead of, of Scottish government targets. They're way ahead of other sectors. So we are we should have been shouting a bit more about that, really. Um, NHS Tayside uh, is following that trend quite nicely. Energy consumption down about 41%, CO2 emissions down about 64%. So you're kind of following that, that trajectory. Um, so that, you know, they are really, really big achievements that, that have been done. Um, and this is how we've done it. So the top left there, some of you may or may not recognise that, but that is the CHP, new CHP engine going in at Nine Wells a couple of years ago. We did a huge energy project at Nine Wells where we replaced the energy centre, we replaced all the lighting, we did a whole load of other energy works there. And we reduced that site's energy consumption, I believe, by about 36 percent. So, you know, really, really big impacts. And we've done similar things across the rest of the estate. So you notice in the previous graph, there was quite a big drop in the 1990s, and that was due to eradicating coal from the estate. So we've been doing a lot of that work around, you know, really tackling our big energy centres. The top middle, that was that was a lighting project down in Dumfries and Galloway, but I would put that in just to recognise that we do a lot of work around... Um, smaller energy efficiency projects so looking at what we've got and getting it to run more efficiently particularly around lighting but also looking at controls and and other things like that and we are being much more mindful about our new builds as well and making sure that they are designed to be low actually going forward to now be zero carbon uh, that's a photograph of the new Balfour hospital up in Orkney which technically is the UK's first zero carbon hospital so all of those pieces of work have been happening um, the photos on the bottom are areas of work and sustainability on other areas that are not necessarily reflected in those figures across the estate, but, but they're really important, just wanted to highlight them. So we've done a lot of work around our green space, improving the quality of the green space and encouraging more people to use it, building community gardens, building growing spaces, outdoor meeting spaces. Um, there is a report I can put in the chat maybe after this and uh, if people want to get access to, to what we've done. Lots of work around circular economy and, and trying to improve our waste management. And this was a project, I believe this was actually rolled out in Tayside as a pilot to reclaim the uh, the metal from, sorry, I'm not a clinician, the thing that you use to intubate patients, that thing, um, but to reclaim the metal from that. There was a cost benefit to the board as well as obviously reclaim, um, uh, an environmental benefit. And I think Pavan will talk about this later, but there's been a lot of work around anaesthetic gases, which carry a high global warming potential and lots of work from consultant anaesthetists all around the country about how, how we can uh, make that better. Um, but I think it's fair to say that all of that work mo and most of that work has been done, I, I use this phrase a lot, sustainability by stealth. So a lot of the projects that I've talk talked about, your average member of staff, your average patient won't be aware of them, 
you, some of you maybe weren't aware until I was talking today that we'd done that huge energy project at Nine Wells. And to a certain extent, some of you won't care. And that's that's OK when you're in that working environment. All you want to know is that you're working in a warm, well lit, comfortable environment. And the fact that we're doing it in a very sustainable way is great. But, you know, you, you didn't realise where we are now to get to net zero. We, we can't do it by self anymore. We need everybody engaged. If I come back to this graph, that green line said kind of where we are now. Um, Decarbonisation of the electricity grid, which has nearly happened in Scotland, should happen within the next probably five to ten years. We'll get us there. Um, there's a lot of talk about this. You'll, you'll hear it in Parliament a lot. It's fine, we're decarbonising the grid. It'll get us there. Um, we need to achieve, to meet Scottish Government targets, we need to achieve a 75% reduction by 2030, a 90% reduction by 2040, and then we've got to get the graph all the way down to the bottom to achieve net zero by 2045. They're big numbers, they're big chunks, and as I said, we cannot do it now just through changes to the estate, and now we need to get everybody on board. The other thing to bear in mind is that climate change, whilst it is hugely important, does not sit in isolation. There are broader sustainability issues that we need to tackle as well. Um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals from 2015 gave a framework for countries, for organisations, and we've been doing a lot, lot of work uh, within NHS National Services Scotland about how we can get a frame a, a way of assessing these for all of the boards because they're, they're quite some of these topics if you look at them they're really quite huge big sort of global issues and it's quite difficult sometimes for individual hospitals or individual boards to say well what does that that mean for us and how, how can we tackle it within the nhs and also climate change is not the only environmental impact we also have to be aware that um particularly around our hospital sites that that are we use a lot of chemicals we use a lot of biological agents that are, are pharmaceuticals and these carry environment other environmental impacts as well as climate change and it's important that we seek to minimize those as much as we can as well so what I'm working on just now is a new NHS Scotland climate change and sustainability strategy. It should have been out by now, but as with everything else, COVID has delayed an awful lot of things. It will be out, if not in December, it will be out certainly before the end of the financial year. And what it was important for us to do with the strategy is to take that holistic approach. So we are looking at climate change and sustainability and environmental management and compliance. So the strategy is going to look at all of these different areas. It's not just going to give a quick carbon target. But what we did do last year um, when we were in the middle of, of responding to climate emergency was we did get our chief executives to agree to six initial high level climate change commitments, which I've, I've put there. Um, I'll make these slides available, by the way, for everybody, so you don't need to frantically write anything down. Um, at the stage of last year, we kept these fairly high levels, so the strategy is going to go into a bit more detail about how we're actually going to, to meet some of these. But front and centre at the very top, um, we have committed we will be a net zero organisation by 2045 at the latest. That will align with Scottish Government's targets. If we can do it any quicker, absolutely we will. Um, just a couple of other things I wanted to highlight within there. Um, in terms of new builds and major refurbishments, we've made a commitment that they will now be designed net zero. Um, and we have a new um, sustainable design and construction guide that we're making available to the boards to assist with that. Um, we are working on climate change risk assessments for all the boards that should all be done by the end of next year. So that's recognising that some uh, elements of climate change are already built in. So how do we adapt to those? And we're working very hard to decarbonise our fleet within the next five years, again, to align the Scottish Government's targets. Um, in terms of how we're tackling sort of broader sustainability, uh, we developed the sustainability action branding. I'll show you some more examples of how that's that's being used, but that branding is available for anybody to use uh, across the NHS. So if you want to use it for any kind of sustainability campaign, whether it's related to climate change or whether it's related to some of the broader aspects, that's absolutely fine. We have a new um, NHS Scotland Sustainability Assessment Toolkit, and it assesses boards' performance across these 16 areas of focus, which, which are listed there. And they roughly align with the tagline from the Sustainability Action Branding, our NHS, our people, our planet. So this is trying to take a real holistic approach to sustainability across the NHS. Um, to get us there, with we've got a number of supporting resources, and this is available from NSS. Um, we have the sustainability uh, assessment tool. Uh, the latest version of the tool actually doesn't. This is an old screenshot, but the the new toolkit is slightly different. But 
as I said, we assess boards across these 16 areas of focus and each one essentially has a high level best practice statement and then the board self assess on the basis of yes, we're 100% we've done it to no, we've, we've not done it at all. They get scored and then that gives us that that enables us to give a numerical score to the NHS boards. Um, we originally baselined all the boards in 2018-19. Uh, and This is where they were all sitting. Uh, We've, what I've put in there is the bronze, silver, gold and platinum. Uh, ultimately, we want everybody to move towards the right hand part of that graph. NHS Tayside is sitting, where are you? Um, yeah, not too bad, kind of top tier, but you, you got you certainly got bronze, but lo uh, a long way to go to, to be fully compliant with all of this. Mentioned about the branding, this is just a couple of other examples of how it's been used. Uh, we've got some boards now using this for posters for waste campaigns energy campaigns um but it can be used for as I said anything to any anything in relation to sustainability and we have got a dedicated sustainability website sustainabilityaction.scot.nhs.uk where you can get you can download the toolkit you can download the branding uh you can get access to case studies you can get access to lots and lots of pieces of information there and and, and access to the team if anybody needs it uh we've developed uh, climate change risk assessment toolkits for the boards to use and a hazard mapping tool for the boards to use and I said they're, we're doing a lot of work over the next year to work with all the boards so that we can get to each board having a full climate change risk assessment and adaptation plan and right now we're working on the development of the new NHS Scotland environmental management system so I mentioned about the the broader environmental impacts and, and this will capture those and ensure compliance certainly with with environmental legislation that's in pilot at the moment with a couple of boards it'll be rolled out to all the boards before the end of the financial year last thing I want to leave you with is if you remember right back at the start I mentioned the quote from the Lancet from 2009 which recognized uh, climate change as big and being the biggest global health threat um, this is the same committee six years later and the quote changed and what they said was tackling climate change could now be the biggest global health opportunity the co-benefits associated with tackling climate change in terms of improved air quality in terms of getting people fitter if they're doing more active travel in terms of uh just just the improved environment and impro improved social conditions which could be better better health qualities this is all good so i will leave you with that hopefully positive message and uh, thank you okay thank you so much uh that that was really inspiring and uh, very useful i think to all of us to get an un a wider understanding of the of the vision um I, I was going to ask our audience if uh, while uh, Pavan's doing his presentation, if you could maybe put questions in the chat box that we could come back to at the end for either Kate or Pavan. How does that sound? So while, while, um, while we're continuing, please put questions in there and then uh, we, we can uh, have a little bit of time at the end. Pavan, are you happy to move on to yours? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see my screen? The presentation, perfect, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rod, and thanks, Kate, for that uh, amazing presentation. Um, it just gives a overview of all the work that's happening and all the plans in the next few years. And uh, thanks to Munro for uh, um, yeah, thinking of this. And uh, he couldn't be he couldn't he couldn't join us today. But I'm sure he'll be catching up this later on uh, YouTube. So I'm going to be uh, I'm one of the anesthetists for those uh, who don't know me. And I'm quite passionate about uh, environmental sustainability and healthcare. Uh, so I'm going to be telling you about some of the projects that we did and uh, uh, how anesthesia as such can be carbon um, rich doctors and, and how can we reduce that um, is what I'll be focusing on. So uh, I'm sure some of you will be aware of this. Um, if you divide the world into countries emit, uh, based on their carbon uh, emission, uh, global healthcare is the fifth biggest country. So that just um, 
demonstrates the scale um, uh, of the problem that, that we are facing with. And I think each, uh, each of us uh, should be contributing to reduce this and make the country smaller. Um, and again, uh, as Kate already described, I'm not gonna go through any of the details, um, uh, health and climate, they're kind of um, uh, connected to each other. They are mutually beneficial to each other. They have co-benefits. So we need to look after climate so that we can look after our health uh, in return. So I'm gonna be fo focusing mainly um, on the inhalational agents. Uh, so inhalational agents, as anesthetists, we use this to keep uh, people off to sleep in, in layman terms. So when um, when people are having their, when patients are having their surgery, uh, they're, one of the ways that we can keep them asleep is using these inhalational agents. Um, these, just a little bit of background. Um, so these inhalational agents get um, um, get into the body through through lungs, and then they um, exert their effect and they hardly get metabolized. So they just go back to the environment. And that is where uh, it can have a, it can have an um, harmful effect. Uh, so if you see uh, the picture on the left-hand side, uh, it shows the different layers um, of, the, of our atmosphere. What uh, we're concentrating on is at 10,000 meters, this trooper pause, um, which is where um, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a barrier uh, um, or, or where the greenhouse gases can um, uh, can kind of hit that and get reflected back to the earth if they, sorry, uh, if it if get reflected back to the earth, um, uh, if it's not uh, emitted back into space. So how does inhalation agents related to this? Uh, if you see the picture on the right-hand side, uh, these are all the different inhalation agents with a big red arrow, the tallest one. Um, they, their uh, uh, wavelength, coincides with a small atmospheric window in this tropopause or the, or, the, um, uh, or the layer that I was just describing a minute ago. Uh, so what these do is um, the, the uh, greenhouse gases, they have, there's a small uh, atmospheric window in this layer. And then through that window, all these greenhouse gases escape. But one of the issues with inhalation agents is they go and block that window. And that, that is how they can contribute to the greenhouse gas effect. Um, we use different agents in, in Tayside. Most commonly, uh, what we use is something called zeofluorine and desfluorine, and um, uh, with a few more pictorial um, uh, uh, slides, I'll be able to demonstrate uh, which one of these has uh, got the most harmful effect. So just to give you an overview of how many anesthetics we do uh, in a year, this is, a, this is based on our national audit project, uh, which happened a few years ago. Um, so that gives us a kind of an um, uh, overview of the number of cases we do. Uh, so still the most common practice is when uh, the patients go off to sleep, uh, which is called the process of induction, they use an uh, intravenous agent most commonly, although some patients still need um, this inhalation agent. Whereas to keep them asleep, which is the longer part of the anesthetic while the surgery is happening, uh, majority of us that. 70% um, use pseudofluorine, um, it's one of the inhalational agents. And still, uh, if you see among the list, um, the intravenous agent, which can be used to keep uh, people uh, asleep is uh, very, very little. Just one in 10 patients get that uh, for as a maintenance agent. But although that can be, uh, the, the numbers could have increased now because the awareness has increased and people understand the uh, ill effects of the inhalation agents and the environmental harm uh, that it can be caused by these. So it's again, the scale is massive. If you are thinking um, hey, this is not a problem, that is not the case. This is a big problem. Um, again, if you, Royal College um, has, has got this slide, again, it just shows you the scale uh, of carbon dioxide uh, production. Uh, we're talking about tons of carbon dioxide here uh, and it's contributed by nitrous oxide, entonox, uh, Cefluorine, isofluorine, and desfluorine, and if you see the, the, the uh, I mean, and these are the commonly used inhalation agents in the in the hospital. Um, and and again to demonstrate use of, use of inhalation agents um, for uh, for an anesthetic for, for a case uh, based on the kind of anesthesia we'll be using. So if you concentrate on the left hand uh, part of the graph, um, th this is based on. Uh, 
model case when, when somebody's undergoing a total knee replacement. Um, so if they're having a general anesthetic and we're using an inhalational uh, agent called desflurane, the amount of carbon dioxide generated is massive. It's 138 kilogram of uh, CO2e as compared to TIVA, which is total intravenous anesthesia, when we use propofol or intravenous agent as a maintenance agent, or a regional anesthesia part, which is spinal anesthetic. So they've looked into lots of things that can contribute to the overall carbon dioxide emission, and they've devised this graph. And again, it's, it's uh, done by uh, uh, Royal College uh, under the guidance of uh, Tom Pierce, who's one of the leading figures in environmental sustainability in healthcare among anesthetists. So how, I mean, when we talk about carbon dioxide gas, we talk about tons and how does this look? So if you, if you see on the left um, picture um, and you're using a car to commute every day to generate one ton of carbon dioxide gas, which could look like that cube there, uh, you need to travel eight and a half miles every day for 46 weeks, it's almost a year, but if you want to achieve that in a very short period, just use this inhalation agent called desflurane. So if you use that uh, desflurane inhalation agent for, if you use a one bottle, uh, you can generate that kind of carbon dioxide. So uh, it's, it, it's got a massive environmental um, harm um, effect, unfortunately. It got some clinical advantages, but uh, there are um, equal, similar kind of advantages can be achieved by using different techniques. And that is what we are, we are uh, trying to achieve. Again, another way of describing this, um, if you look into global desflurane um, use, uh, it's as big as Bedford in, um, um, the, uh, down in England. And if you look into nitrous oxide uh, use, the um, carbon dioxide effect is as big as a metropolitan Bristol um, city area. So again, just to demonstrate the scale of the problem here. Um, another way to look at it is, is, is this is probably kind of um, uh, it, it much easier to understand. If you're using desflurane along with nitrous uh, oxide for uh, keeping someone asleep, um, that equates to three times emissions that caused by an hour of trans transatlantic flight. But if you're using another inhalational agent um, called ceofluorane, which is less harmful to the environment, uh, the, the effect is very, very, uh, I mean, much less than uh, compared to the desflurane. Whereas this work has not been uh, not done on the intravenous agent as yet, but if you use that, the early reports say the effect is even, even more um, uh, less uh, compared to desflurane or ceofluorane. And again, it's like, if you're using CEVO, it's like flying a flight um, uh, from uh, UK to America, uh, like a single flight with similar kind of uh, passengers, number of passengers. Whereas if you're using desflurane, it's equivalent to flying several small flights as in, uh, with smaller number of passengers. So that's the kind of carbon dioxide uh, emission effect that these agents can have. Um, another interesting study, it was done in 2017, just, just by looking at um, the kind of anesthetic gas and, and the energy uh, used. If you see here, the three different hospitals, um, one is in Vancouver, um, other one is Minnesota, and the third one is C is John Radcliffe. Um, in John Radcliffe Hospital, they do not, they didn't use uh, desflurane as the main anesthetic gas. And uh, uh, you can see their CO2 contribution is mainly from the energy as compared to the other two hospitals. So it just depends on the hospital, depends on the country and depends on the energy, energy uh, source. Uh, uh, so it, you can't kind of generalize everything to the world, but it's easy enough to get this information in the, in the current era. So what did we do, um, especially for those who um, love their uh, desflurane? Uh, we kind of did a, an educational day, um, mentioned, mentioned about it. Actually, Grant and I, I think back in 2015, had a, a debate to um, say whether desflurane should be kept in cupboards or should it be taken out uh, and reg eat, used regularly for almost all the patients and just presented all this um, evidence that was there. Um, and I'll show you some data uh, of how the desflurane use has come down over the years because there's increased awareness and we've raised awareness with different projects as well. Uh, 2018, during Clean Air Day, what we did was we, um, again, uh, presented all the facts 
and uh, uh, took the action of taking desflurane vaporizers off the anesthetic machines from most of the theaters. We left it in emergency theaters because the uh, 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 because some clinicians thought that they used um, is uh, more relevant there. So we left few desflurane machines attached to the machines, but most of it, uh, most of the vaporizers were taken off uh, the anesthetic machines, and we left it in the uh, cup. Uh, kept a few in the cupboard and sent most of it back to medical physics. So what kind of impact that, uh, and, and once we did that, we also educated uh, or, or kind of raised awareness on um, using uh, less flows of uh, um, gases like oxygen and air, the ones we use uh, um, uh, as carrier gas for these inhalational agents. Uh, so we, one of the things that in anesthetic rooms we do is, when patients are going off to sleep, we turn them with really high flows, which could lead to a lot of waste. So to reduce that, we um, uh, limited the, I mean, we uh, raised awareness to say, limit the flow to four liters per minute. Um, and then uh, in theater, uh, we gave specific um, uh, instructions to uh, minimize the use of desflurane uh, or uh, the inhalational agents. So basically we call it low flow anesthesia. So I'm not gonna go through in detail about what low flow anesthesia is here. Uh, and uh, like I said, in June, 2018 on clean air day, uh, we ran this uh, nitrous and dust free day. We called it bin the blue gases. Um, it basically um, raised the harm that, that are caused by these two uh, inhalational agents and ask them, ask different anesthetists to use less of it or if it don't use it at all. Um, and we took a snapshot of uh, um, the impact it had. So in 2017, we had used 163 uh, bottles of desflurane, uh, whereas in 2018, the similar period, the use has come down to 30 bottles. And that just shows the difference in carbon dioxide, uh, the CO2E uh, of desflurane. Um, and we thought this might have reflected as increased use in CO-fluorine, but if you see there, it, that's not the case. So people obviously have, have looked into other ways to adapt and use less and less of desflurane, but it was not completely off. So what did we do? Um, again, we had a journal pub recently based on, a, based on one of the papers that was published. Um, and then we had a departmental meeting again, um, um, showing all this data. So I collected the data for the last four years, um, thanks to a pharmacist which, who um, gave us all the um, uh, use of desflurane. So if you see the expenditure in 2016, um, we were um, spending more than 50,000 pounds on this. So now um, the last year we've used less than 5,000 pounds. So there's a, it's cost effective. Quantity, I mean, a little bit could be influenced by uh, slightly reduced uh, work uh, because of COVID and uh, uh, the, uh, the other factors, but overall the, the use of desflurane has come down drastically. Quantity as well, uh, nearly 700 bottles were used four years ago, coming down to 55 bottles now. Um, CO2, that, this is the biggest impact. Um, so uh, if you see the numbers, they are staggering. Uh, we've come down quite uh, drastically. And if you convert that into number of miles, that's driven by a standard car um, in terms of carbon dioxide equivalency, you can see uh, how much reduction uh, we've achieved over the last four years. It's not completely gone, uh, but uh, it's definitely going in the right direction. So what did we further do? So not that long ago, just two days ago, we've removed all desflurane vaporizers from uh, our anesthetic machines. So, but still there are a few clinicians who feel very strongly that it's got some clinical advantages. Um, uh, and obviously um, uh, we are not here to kind of uh, dictate what each clinician should do. So um, we, what we've done is we've stored one vaporizer per theta suite. So we have three theta suites running at the moment. Uh, so we've kept one vaporizer in each theta suite. So if the clinician wants to use the desflurane vaporizer, they can ask for it. Uh, one of the things with desflurane vaporizer is if it's mounted on the uh, anesthetic machine, it consumes electricity as well because, uh, because of the property uh, of the gas itself. So that adds to the environmental impact. So overall, um, uh, We've taken off all the desflurane vaporizers. The other thing we've done is the, the in, when these vaporizers are taken off, there's always residual desflurane that's left. So if you don't do anything, that just get drained and um, evaporated into atmosphere, which is not good. So at least 
we use it on uh, the indicated patients and use it effectively so that there is hardly any residual desflurane that's left in these vaporizers and these vaporizers can be returned back to manufacturers. So that, that is the plan we've made now. A few other things very quickly. Um, in our department, and as you see, uh, in, in their side, there are around 11,000 computers. Uh, in the, most of the computers are left on, they don't switch it off completely. So we, in the department, we uh, kind of publish these um, uh, figures and ask or encourage people to switch it off when they're going back home, especially at the weekends for two days, it's left on, even in standby mode, it uses quite a bit of uh, energy and it's, it is uh, expensive. And if you see the numbers there, this is just for one, one computer. Uh, so you can imagine the you know, amount of money we can save uh, by simply turning it off when you're not using it. With new computers, this should be even more easy. Um, and, and as I said, Monday to Friday, comprises only 30% of the week. So 70% of the times we won't be using these computers. So one thing to think about, although lights and air cons. So what we did was we put these um, uh, stickers um, on the switches and uh, our clinical lead at that time, Jason Hardy, um, uh, sent, sent me a picture and put it on our face, Facebook group um, to show how on one weekend, how the department was, all the lights were switched off. And so they, they, it had some uh, effect. They side on a regular basis, they send this information. So uh, when you get those um, emails, generic emails, please don't just delete, look, look at what it is. It's very, very informative. Um, and the other thing was the waste management. Uh, the waste, uh, again, um, uh, uh, because of the time, I'm not going to speak too much about the numbers here, but what we should think of is not just recycle, refusing it when it's not required and reducing the use. Don't just open it and think, oh, this is not needed, I'll just spin it. So think before, basically plan before you prepare uh, and then use it very appropriately. Um, so we made these over the sink, um, um, uh, the posters and uh, we again raised awareness and did some education on this to improve before uh, I think there were a few years ago we were disposing everything into orange bags and they were getting incinerated so we've come um, uh, quite quite far uh, from it and we use uh, we recycle reasonably well uh, although we can do so much more uh, work on this and the work goes on um, in the department. Kate was talking about this metal recycling trial. Yeah, yeah um, we did this uh, a few years ago. Um, I think it was a it was a six week trial as it as it shows. Um, so the thing she was talking about that goes into the mouth is laryngoscope. Uh, so which is obviously made of metal. Uh, at the moment, it just goes into a sharp spin, which gets incinerated. So we uh, there was a company who uh, were willing to recycle this. So we got together with them and did this uh, metal recycling trial and it showed benefits for the environment and for the purse, uh, and it's a side economy as well. Um, so if you look at it, the amount of um, amount of plastic or, and, and the metal that would have been just burned, uh, or it's still happening at the moment, unfortunately, because the trial has not become a reality yet uh, because the waste companies have changed and the company which did the trial with us, uh, they don't exist uh, anymore. So the, if you guess the weight, that's equivalent to a weight of a one adult hippopotamus. So that's a massive amount of weight we would, uh, or, or the carbon dioxide equivalence effect we would, we would save uh, if we start doing metal recycling trial. Our new waste manager is very keen to do this and hopefully we'll be picking that up soon. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, like I said, plan before you prepare, waste management, follow waste hierarchy, think before you open anything. Uh, it's not just about recycling, it's about refusing and reducing the waste. Um, avoid disposable theater attire whenever appropriate. I know with the COVID situation, it can change a bit. Lights, computers, think about air conditioners, printers, you can think about those things. Avoid disposable cups, especially the polystyrene ones, they and single use plastic bottles. They, they are um, uh, unfortunately planet's um, enemy. Think about car share. Again, I would say with caution because of the COVID situation, um, raise awareness, educate people uh, and get involved in different projects and get in touch with us. There are plenty of resources available, especially from the anesthetic point of view, we have Association of Anesthetists who describe all this, Royal College of Anesthetists do the same. Um, there are these calculators which, which tells us if you're using an anesthetic agent in a particular way, how much carbon dioxide will be uh, emitting, how much money we'll be saving and also there are e-learning modules um, that will be coming out or it's come out on Royal College websites. So 
and we've made a, a infographic uh, um, uh, Dr. Tim Smith and one of the other consultant anesthetists in uh, Perth and I um, got together and made this infographic highlighting the use uh, issues with desflurane and nitrous oxide uh, and also some tips how we can be more green. So if anybody would like a copy of it, please uh, get in touch with us, We'd be more than happy to share. Um, so ultimately, the, um, we all talk about plan A if plan A doesn't work. We talk about plan B if the plan B doesn't work. We talk about plan C. But what we need to remember is there is no planet B. So we need to save our planet A to make sure uh, we give a better uh, life to our future generations. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, there's a few acknowledgments here. Um, uh, and uh, my email is there if anybody wants to get in touch with me. Thanks for listening. Van, thank you so much for a really inspiring uh, presentation. I always love to actually see real practical things being done and measured and in practice. And you as an anesthetics uh, department, I think are really a shining example of what a lot of us could do better. So I think it'd be lovely if we can um, just grow that around the hospital and influence other departments and, and, and grow what you've been doing. But I think it's your passion and a few of you in your department that I think has really made the difference. Um, uh, we do have a little bit of time. Tom, how much uh, time have we got to spare? Can we, 10 minutes or? There's 14 minutes. 14 minutes, yeah. Um, and there are a few um, questions that have come and suggestions that have come through the, uh, through the chat box. I think Tom, would you mind if we kick off with you just with an inhalers? You know, um, th there's a huge imp uh, impact of, of inhalers. Yeah, um, uh, one of the benefits of doing this over Zoom is I just happen to have a few slides that are already prepared. <laughs> so I'll just show them to you rather than trying to talk about it. Um, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, we use an awful lot of inhalers across the whole of Scotland and across the Tayside. Um, and I think probably we don't recognize that there's a huge amount of, uh, the carbon footprint of these devices is big, but also um, it varies a huge amount. So um, there are currently 9,000 people with COPD in Tayside and 28,000 people with asthma. So you're talking about you know, nearly 40,000 people. You prescribe them, they get a new inhaler every month for the entirety of their life. That's a huge amount. And you think about how um, the, the DPI is dry powder inhaler and MDI is meter dose inhaler. So these are the push and squoosh ones that you would you know, used to seeing. The dry powder ones are the, generally the, are the other ones. And the, the, the fold difference is enormous. Um, so, you know, you look at a, um, what's a good one. So um, Rel, Relvar is very good, for example. That's only 573 grams. Whereas if you give somebody uh, Symbicort, through the MDI, it's 35,000. That's a huge difference. Um, and we've never really thought about this in our prescribing practice, you know, in formularies, or um, we're only just starting to think about that now. And if I think if you, if you showed that to your new start asthma patient, which would you rather have? They're both as efficacious, which would you rather use? I think they, well, I mean, let you decide what they would choose. This is just some data to look at the, this is for the whole of, this is actually, this is NH Lothian. I'm not sure I've got the Scotland data. Uh, that's this is anxious loathing data for what it's worth but we're very similar that um that uh, we generate about two and a half million kilograms of co2 just from our inhaler use and if we switch to the the, the elliptic device is the one which is that has the smallest carbon footprint so if you made a 100% switch from what we're doing at the moment to elliptors we'd go from two and a half million kilograms of co2 down to 108,000. that's an enormous thing and you'd set you know and you'd save money about half a million quid. What does that mean in, in, in terms that are easier to digest? Um, if you give somebody, um, if you're using uh, the low carbon footprint devices like a, the Relvar elliptor or an, Aki, an Anakihaler, the carbon footprint is small. If you use a serotide evahaler or a Ventolin evahaler, it's enormous. And, and these are the kind of impacts you'd have if you do things like plant a tree, use change your light bulbs, recycle absolutely everything is 210, avoid all food waste completely 370. And we're up here at 500, which is become vegan or change to a, a hybrid car and changing your inhaler device from a very commonly used group, which is um, 450 kilograms a, a year down to Relvar is it's the same. It's almost the same as going vegan. So that's just an enormous impact you can have um, by changing inhalers something that work is ongoing. Tom, thanks very much. And um, 
I think there was another comment in the chat box from John Dahl just about um, the impact of conferences and how we we continue our CPD. Um, and I think that's probably an interesting one that we, we should probably think about more deeply, both from an NHS and a university perspective as to how we can really optimize um, how we, you know, get the, the mix of the enjoyment of uh, attending conferences from a social perspective, but also save to um, less flying around uh, around the world. So that, John, I don't think John's still, uh, John, are you still with us? You, I just didn't see you still there. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm here. Oh, and oh, can, I'm happy to, um, you know, contribute along that journey if we can, picking up maybe with the university side, if there's anyone interested on the NHS side, or some push for a bit of a change of policy and an approach towards that well, seems worthwhile. Maybe an, try and get an exemplar that could be um, waved in front of people to show the, the relative merits of, of imaginative local approaches, perhaps. Yeah, no, I think that's another great one, uh, that, uh, great idea for the future. Um, are there any other questions? I think I have one for you, Kate, if, if, if you don't mind. I, um, the supply chains you'd alluded to as being a big... Uh, uh, components of this this sort of um, this problem. I'm I'm very aware of them, uh, particularly in relation to the textile industry, and the and the the stuff we wear, because I've been involved in projects. But I'm very aware as a surgeon, the supply chains of the the stuff we use, the instruments and everything, um, is very wasteful. Have you, are there, do you have any thoughts on how we could do things better? Uh, that what we're the approach that we're trying to take with national procurements so for those of you who are not aware national procurement that again sits within nss accounts for about 80 percent of the goods and services across nhs scotland the approach that they're trying to do now is say right let's talk to our top 100 suppliers our top 100 suppliers account for about 50 percent of what we buy so we're now talking to all those suppliers and working with them directly and saying we want you to come to us and tell us that this product that you've provided is carbon neutral, zero carbon, and also ticks, you know, a number of other sustainability issues. We don't want to be buying stuff that, that's relying on um, modern slavery, for example. We don't want to buy products that are contributing to, to other environmental impacts, as, as we've spoken about. So we are taking that approach to say, right, let's identify our top 100 suppliers. Also, let's, let's identify our hotspots. So where are the biggest environmental impacts coming from? So um, medium dose inhalers being mentioned, uh, some of the other pharmaceuticals that we have, you know, so, so try and identify those and then work directly with those suppliers. But it's, it's not an easy thing. It's, it's really, really hard to do. And it's something that Scottish government are now recognising that they're having to tackle across the whole of the public sector. So it's partly about raising awareness amongst people who are asking for this stuff. So almost the, the waste analogy of do you really need to ask if you need it first? So asking for people, people who ask for these things to be bought, doing that whole process in their head of is it something we really need? You know, if, and if you do need it, is can we recycle? Can we reuse? Can we buy can we buy it from it? and then if we do need to buy something making sure that we're buying the most environmentally friendly friendly product that we can unfortunately there's a lot of other pieces of legislation that act against us with this so some of the um scottish procurement regulations or the public sector procurement regulations can get in the way of of very good intentions coming from buyers so much as i would love to say that we're going to put something in place across nhs scotland to say that um, say, for example, in our construction products, when we do a building, we could say, right, we, we're only going to have a construction product here if, if the embodied carbon is less than this. Current procurement regulations don't allow us to do that. So there's a lot of work happening at Scottish government level to try and look at those buying powers, those pieces of legislation, where they're causing barriers and how they can break down those barriers. It's a it's a huge, complicated thing. I think one of the best things that we can do is through forums like this, is raise the awareness and have people thinking about it. We can see that that's happening in the public. You mentioned fashion and it's kind of getting some traction now amongst the general public when they realize the, the environmental impact across some of the fast fashion that they buy in some, some, some uh, so once, so that there's a customer demand and you can see some of the big, big fashion chains now doing things differently. Um, so maybe if we can do that in the NHS, if we can start to, to have people demanding the better products then that will that that will help but it's 
it, it it's not easy. I'm not yeah. going to pretend it's easy at all. So th thanks very much, Kato. Um, is there anybody else in the audience that has any questions for, for Kato Pavan? Um, I see Monroe Stewart's with us. Uh, Monroe, you, you'd set this all up and a big thank you to you for today, but you struggled to get to the early part of the meeting. Were there any, any things you have, you have a great visions for what we can do and, and how we could do this. Uh, any, any thoughts just to sort of round up at the end of this presentation? Thanks very much. Yes, sorry, I couldn't make it. Unfortunately, I was um, at a funeral earlier. Um, I think uh, it'd be great to see a bit more involvement from different departments in the NHS Tayside Sustainability Group. We see that one of the biggest projects there is the uh, inhaler. So it'd be great if someone from respiratory department could just come and uh, sit on our, on our group um, and ideally someone from each department. We're going to have a, a prize next year for sustainability as well, which is an opportunity for anyone at any part of the NHS to show the work that's been going on in, in their department. So. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to get a bit more involvement in the uh, sustainability group. So you can give any one of us an email and we'd be delighted to hear from you. And I'll get in touch with you, John Dowell, as well about, about that. Thanks for bringing me in there. Cheers. Yeah, no, no. Uh, and thank you for setting up uh, really two of these sessions that we've had. The previous one was excellent as well. And I think we do have plans for some future grand rounds that will bring sustainability into, the, into almost a theme that we keep, keep working on. I think we'd probably round up there if that's all right with uh, with everyone. There've been one or two other suggestions come through the uh, the, the, the suggestion box, the chats. Um, I think the lights in the hospital, the university, and the way we all waste and don't switch off computers. I think we could all do that very easily. Um, the cycle to work scheme. Um, Tom's brought in um, having better facilities for showering, bike storage, all that sort of stuff. So there's. There's a whole lot of stuff that I think we can do um, more effectively in Tayside. So uh, a very big thank you to, to Kate and to Pavan for doing the chat to us uh, today. It's been really inspiring and um, we'll keep, keep, keep the show on the road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Tom and Monroe. Catch up soon. <laughs>